what a week we have had here in Delaware. Hmm. And uh, well, I just, I just want to start off by thanking God. Thanking God for his faithfulness. God, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. It was uh, Monday. Uh, I felt like we needed to close our offices and just work remotely. And um, my brother, who runs a summer break camp for the called uh, Summer Break Camp, um, he's in charge of that. He went ahead and closed it for the day. Um, and we don't normally do that. We don't normally do that. We weather rain and wind to come to work. And, um, but we decided not to. And that was God. That was God leading us because there would have been a lot of kids and staff here in that building. It would have been terrifying for them. Um, I was down the street on South State Street getting my eyes checked and having my first appointment at an office. And the tornado went right over that building. And um, the power went out. The alarm went off on the phones to take shelter immediately. And all of a sudden, I heard a train. And I'm like, there's no train over here <laughs> on State Street. And then staff members of the Delaware Eye Care Center, they said that their ears started popping. So we just hunkered down in offices in the middle of the building. We didn't know how big it was. We didn't know how small it was. It wasn't until I went outside after it had passed to see that it didn't you know, destroy homes, that it only tore up trees. Um, and the trees were falling on power lines and on homes and such. It was, uh, I'll be honest with you, it was a little terrifying at first. And right away, the thought was, how's my family? Did they already go through Felton? And I didn't know that, you know, so I was kind of concerned. And, um, and then I was videotaping, though, so that people could know right away to take shelter when you get those warnings because it was real. Because we get a lot of those warnings, right? But it doesn't always happen. And so I filmed this video right away to help people see that. Um, I'm getting in my car after cleaning the debris away from the parking lot because we couldn't even leave because all the trees were blocking our cars. Um, Dorothy calls me and says, come to the church immediately. The church got hit. And so I had to navigate on Route 1 to get here and come around the base Route 1 area to get here because South State Street, I didn't know it, how bad it was. I could see it from the office. It was bad, but it was bad. Like that, there's a lot of damage on South State Street here and the neighborhoods around us here. Um, what a day. What a day. Um, but I have to say, a lot of people asked me that day how I'm doing, and I had joy in the midst of that storm. And um, you know why? Because immediately I saw the goodness and love of God when the church and the school community came together to help clean. And there was hope immediately after the storm that we're going to rebuild. And that day, we had already removed all of the bad pieces of wood off of our um, ceiling and the education wing, already moved all the stuff out of the classrooms and got them set up. Uh, got it in dry areas, and had tarps on the roof ready for the shingles the next day. Like, what's the chances of having sh shingles in the next day, all that? We had, it was just God. And uh, just a shout out to uh, Majestic c &M, David and Tasha Gribbins, for getting right on the roof and calling a team in, and they are members of our church here. And everyone who came out to help, we just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for the gifts that you've given this week to help with expenses and food for the volunteers. It's just been phenomenal. And so that day, while it was concerning for neighbors in our church, I have to just say I, there was joy that rose up in me because I saw God and his goodness immediately. And so I thank God for that. <clears throat> And it really, it's been an interesting week preparing for today's message as I, my heart was to share some vision and direction for our church. And um, sometimes vision gets blurred or gets, sometimes you have to continue to see where, what God is doing in the midst of 2020. Where, where are you supposed to go? What are you supposed to do in the midst of 2020 as a church, as people? And so I did a lot of wrestling with God this week and talking to him. And uh, the scripture that I had is what I remained with for today. I want to go to Acts 20. And we're going to read 16 through 24. Acts 20, uh, 16 through 24. <clears throat> and uh, I, I want to 
concentrate on the scripture today. I think, I think it's really fitting, actually, for Sunday, for today, after a week and a year that we've been going through. And can I just say something real quick? Um, I don't want to dismiss what we've been going through here in America, but the whole world is dealing with this, right? And there are places in the world where it's a third world country where their 2020 is every year. And so when you kind of compare, for us Americans, this is nothing compared to those in Cambodia as we learned last week, right? It's a little worse there. It's dire there, actually. Um, But it doesn't dismiss that we are not used to what we've been going through here. And so um, what is God up to? You know, what do we focus on? What do we do here as a church and as people? I pray you're encouraged by the life of Paul and what he did during difficult times and in this message today. So let's, let's jump right in. Acts 20, 16 says, Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church, the leaders, the overseers of the church at Ephesus, asking them to come and meet him. By the way, this is Luke writing all these things, and uh, he's recording what was taking place. Verse 18, when they arrived, he declared, so Paul is telling the leaders of the Ephesus church, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia till now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. And he went through much more than just attacks of the Jews. He went through much more. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound or compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me. Does that sound familiar for us right now today? We don't know what's going to come up tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next month. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Isn't that interesting? He gets a heads up, a warning from God. Does he he decide to not go? No, he decides to keep going. What would you do if you got a warning that you're going to go to prison and suffering lies ahead? For, for doing good. For sharing the good news of Jesus. What does he say? In verse 24, But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Wow. Wow. What a phenomenal leader. He checks in on his church in Ephesus, the church he helped plant. He's talking to the elders or overseers. He's encouraging them. He's, he's, he's saying that he went through these things to help them and establish this church. And by the way, anything he says and does is an example for his church to live by as well, for the church in Ephesus that he helped plant and start. Um, the, the Ephesians church, they, they didn't have a central location like we do right now to meet together. So they were in their homes. And so they had house churches. And so Paul literally went from house to house to teach the people. Can you imagine how many hours spent in people's homes teaching the word of God? Isn't it cool though now we're in your homes online more than ever? So from house to house he went there. And um, Paul was led by the Spirit And uncertainty didn't phase him. Nothing moved Paul off track or off his purpose. Paul's 2020 was constant and year after year. In other words, Paul learned how to do good and stay focused in the midst of constant 2020s, if you will. He was a great example of perseverance through any season And Paul expressed his life as a race in multiple times in Scripture, a race that he must finish to gain the prize, which is Jesus. 
Well, in this same scripture, we get the same tone that Paul was never going to quit this race until he did what Jesus personally asked him to do, which you can read that in Acts chapter 9, 15 through 17. Paul was persecuting Christians. God gets a hold of him on the road to Damascus, blinds him, and says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus shows up to Paul. Why are you persecuting me? And Jesus takes this heathen of a man, this sinner, and Paul called himself the the worst of sinners, and calls him to share the gospel. And so Paul gives his life to do that no matter how many storms come, no matter what his 2020 looked like. He was determined to give his life to do that. He found joy in completing the task that he received from his Savior. What a powerful scripture. He caught the vision that God had so all may know the good news and follow Jesus. Church, we've been through more than I would like to go through in the past year. And we don't know what awaits us but we know that things shouldn't change just because the world is changing around us. The first thing I want us to learn and to take away from today is we don't know what awaits us, but we know God will lead us. God is with us. God was with us on Tuesday. God was with us on Monday to give us the discernment and a heads up to close this building down. And our hearts grieve for this, our neighbors and our state and those who, I, by the way, I've seen amazing unity online. And from, I called up Pastor Jeff or talked to him online, sorry. And I called up uh, a neighbor across the street who goes to this church. And uh, there is one neighbor across the street that's going to need our help as soon as insurance finishes the adjustments or the assessments, sorry. But I called up, or contacted Jeff Dyer online and he said a lot of people are coming out to help him. Pastor Jeff was a pastor here. His entire land, almost all the trees were knocked down on, Christmas, on the, um, his Christmas tree farm, Dyer's Christmas tree farm. It was, it was insane. And I'm just so grateful that there weren't more people, um, to be honest with you, killed by this. I know of one person in Milford, and it's such a sad loss. Um, but wow, it could have been worse, couldn't it? Could have been worse. No matter what happens, no matter what awaits us, God is faithful. What's really interesting, though, is if you look at the scripture and you breeze through it really fast, you miss the implication of what's going on here. Paul was warned. He was led by God. And that tells me something really important, that Paul had a relationship with God, that Paul was in connection with his Lord. In other words, Paul was hearing from God on what to do. And a question that hit me this week as I was uh, studying and reflecting on this message is, how's my connection with God in the storms? How's my relationship with God going right now when things are rough? Because I think a lot of times we can, we can get so consumed by the storm that we lose time or miss time with the creator of this world with our God, our Father. And Paul was so close to God that the Holy Spirit was leading him and warning him of things. And I think that's important for us. How is your connection with God in 2020? It's not even a main point of today's message, but it hit me this week, and I thought I would just check on us that we have a strong connection with God, that he is leading and guiding us in all the noise and all that's going on right now. Notice that the Holy Spirit wasn't leading Paul away from danger. Wouldn't you want that to happen? (laughs) Like, we got a warning, thank God for this, but for, for this past week. But for Paul, to spread the gospel, God was leading him into places where he would suffer and be persecuted because the gospel is worth it. The good news, the wonderful grace of God is worth going through difficult times if it gets to people that need it. And by the way, 
It's not always the good things that happen to us that show the goodness of God. So all may know God's love and follow Jesus may mean that we go through some difficult times to show the world how good God is. See, God's already moving and speaking through the week we've had here at Calvary. God is using that to bring unity in this church with other people, our neighbors. God is using the dark to bring light. We say so all may know God's love. And, and maybe sometimes we think if our neighbors see how prosperous we are, then they'll see how good God is. But what if our neighbors saw how good God is even when we went through difficult seasons? In other words, we need to be ready for both. When we're, I, we, have, we have people in our church right now, their family members are passing away from cancer. My heart breaks for them. That neighbor across the street needs help financially to make this happen, or at least hands and feet for whatever the insurance doesn't cover to get rid of all the trees in his yard. My heart breaks and grieves for them, but I know that God will use those situations so all may know God's love. Amen? Secondly, we don't know what awaits us. Paul said, I don't know what awaits me. But the message remains the same. We don't know what awaits Calvary, what awaits your life, but the message remains the same. God is good, and the good news is truth, and it's needed for our community. The message didn't need a specific location. Paul didn't have a specific central place like a church building like this. He went from house to house. All he needed was ears that were willing to hear the message. Paul didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He told them what they needed to hear. And he tells us what that is in Scripture. He actually tells people, whether they're rich or they're poor, it didn't matter. He told them the same thing. Drew, Jews or Greeks or, or Gentiles alike, it didn't matter who they were. He taught them the same thing. And you know what the message was? It wasn't like, it wasn't flowers it was truth. Like it wasn't kisses of it's all going to be good, you know, and like nice fluffy stuff. It was truth. And you know what he, he says here? He says the message that he preached was repent, turn away from sin, and put your trust or your faith in Jesus Christ. Paul never watered down that message. No matter what he went through, no matter who he addressed, the message stayed the same. Why? Because if you're poor and you don't have Jesus, you're in danger. If you're rich and you don't have Jesus, you're in danger of losing your life for eternity. And so Paul would never change it to make people feel good. Paul didn't do prosperity gospel with those who were poor so that he would draw them in by, hey, God will bless your life. That, he can't preach that because he's going through really hard times all the time, and he is a devout Christian, a devout follower. If you're devout, it doesn't promise perfect peace on earth. Just a heads up. It may mean, as Paul found out, prison, and suffering. And he didn't go to the rich and preach that to them the poverty gospel, that you must live in poverty. No, he preached that you must put your faith in Christ and not the things of this world and to repent of any sin. And the word repent comes off so strong, doesn't it? It kind of sounds harsh. But you know what it means? It means to turn away, a new direction. And he would say, turn to Christ instead of yourself or the things of this world or the sin of this world. Turn away from those things and turn to me. No matter what Paul went through, no matter what the church went through, that gospel message never changed. I think we can be a little tempted in our world today to soften up the good news of Jesus to make it even happier sounding and, and safe sounding and good sounding. By the way, it's good news because Jesus died for your sin, right? I think we're a little tempted, though, to water it down so that more people will come to Jesus. And we got to be really careful of that. 
In fact, we're living in a time where you can see a lot of preachers and teachers online. And I want to just give you a heads up. Run from any preacher or church who teaches you can have eternal life and live however you think you can or however you want. Run away from that teaching and that preaching. Run from any preacher or church who calls people to believe in Jesus for salvation so they can have a better life, but never says to turn away from sin. Because to follow Jesus is to turn to him and turn away from the things that are evil in this world and to turn from your own sinful ways. Why would Jesus die if we did not have sin to repent of? What would be the point of Jesus dying on the cross? He died because he gave his life up because of our sin, not because we were good. That needs to still be part of the message. Now, do we communicate it with condemnation? No. Paul actually says this in verse 24 at the end. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. The undeserved help, the undeserved favor, the undeserved mercy. What was that for, though? Why did we need God's grace? Because, well, we have sinned as humanity. No matter what they went through as a church, Paul's message never changed. He always told them what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. And when we are tempted to water it down to help people come in, we actually do a disservice to them and tell them false things. So church, but here's the good news. We don't know what awaits us, but the message remains the same. God loves you. He gave up his son Jesus for you. He gave us what we need for eternity. So whatever happens to us here momentarily, we're going to get through it. He's already made a way for us to have life everlasting. And thank God for that. Thirdly, we don't know what awaits us, but the mission must go on. If there was anyone to quit, if there was any time a church would quit, it would be the first church, the early church. Paul went through so much. The church went through so much. Nero in AD 70, around that time, was torturing Christians. The Christian tradition is, is that the Apostle John was actually boiled alive and survived. So they banished him to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation with God's help, obviously, right? Wow. The mission stayed the same no matter what they went through. Their 2020 was worse than ours, and they stayed faithful to the vision that God had. Paul's mission was this, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Today, in the time we're living in right now, even myself, it could be tempting to focus on self-preservation, can it? Let me protect myself, let me protect my family, let's, let's preserve ourselves because everything going on we can be distracted by that, and there are reasons to. But the mission must go on no matter what our world's going through. And it may have to adapt to a different way. We even may succumb to comfort and pleasure in this world. One of the things I've been concerned about since, uh, since March is we've actually gained in the church new bad habits in our homes. God's been speaking to me on that that we have been caught up in new habits in our homes because we haven't been with people of God and there for each other, praying for each other, confessing sin to one another, all those things that we need to do. And so it's something that God's just kind of been whispering to me. And then my mother sends me an article that says, Bible engagement in the past five months has dropped 5% in Christianity. In other words, it used to be 13 to 14% of 
of Christians were using their Bible regularly, it dropped to nine in the past year. And it was holding steady for many years, around 13 to 14. So in a matter of six months to a year, Christians are in their word less. Maybe it's because we're distracted by new things or something else. I don't know. And the only thing we can do is check ourselves on that and check ourselves. It can be tempting to think that this world is so bad. What's the use of doing anything? It can be tempting to give up because it looks like the world has given up on itself, right? It can be tempting to go, there's no point of me trying to reach my neighbor or my friends. What's the use? They're going to hell in a handbasket. No matter what Paul faced, he never quit doing what he was supposed to do. Church, we can't give up. Aren't you glad God didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad that, that Jesus followed through and went to that cross for you? Aren't you glad that the people that prayed for you didn't give up praying for you? The grandmas, the grandpas, the parents, whoever it may be, the friends, the coworkers, aren't you glad they didn't give up on you? My family and I, we're going to give our lives to snatch people out of that basket. I don't care how far gone this world looks or how far gone people are. We can't give up. And Paul never gave up no matter what came. Amen. So let me kind of wrap this up today with some direction and vision. You could hear my heart already on direction and vision that we can't quit just because 2020 has been rough. God is still good. The message is still powerful. The grace of God is still amazing. It's saving lives. Okay? And lastly, the mission must go on. It may look different. It may be some online and some in person. Whatever it's got to be, we got to do it. Because we as a church say we do all we can so all may know God's love and follow Jesus. I know that no matter what takes place, I know why we exist. And there's three things I want you to take away from that. Three things I see in Scripture, no matter what goes on, no matter what Jesus goes through or the apostles in the books that they wrote, here's what I see that never changes. First of all, be faithful to love and worship God. Be faithful to love and worship God. Two, love and encourage one another. We have to be together to do that, though, right? We have to call each other or text each other or we have to be in person. That's my favorite is being together in person. And thirdly, be disciples who reach the unreached. You are followers of Jesus who help other people follow Jesus. And God wants to use you. He used Paul, the worst of sinners. But Paul had to say yes and then start learning the hard way how to do it. But we, as we come together, by the way, we can do that. So we know to love and worship God no matter what. We know to love and encourage one another, and we know to reach the unreached by being disciples who will go. And guess where all that happens? It happens in community or being together. All of that can take place when we come together. And I got to be honest with you. Can I, can I be transparent some more today? You already, I'm always transparent. You always see my heart, Okay. Just to be real with you. By the way, I think we need more transparency in our world, don't we? I, I like when the truth is, I'm being told the truth. Um, I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with what I see in Scripture and what the world's telling me. The world is telling me to not hang out with you and to not be close to you, but the Bible says to be with you. I'm wrestling with that. And, I, and I, can we pray together as a church we, I think there's needs. I think there's definitely concerns for people to stay healthy and safe. And thank God for online ministry for that reason. But we need to get back together again. We need to get back together again. You know who wants to divide the church and keep us 
away from each other, right? It's the enemy, the devil. Whether he uses some person or leaders or avenue or whatever, whatever means he uses, he'll use them to make sure that we are weaker when we're separate from each other. Because we are weaker without each other. And I want to show you this, this board. I went too long the first service. They were so gracious. But I want to be quicker here. And uh, God gave us a vision years ago through Pastor Kuhn to be in community on Sundays, but also throughout the week in our homes or in groups, whether it be in restaurants or whether it be here in the building or at, in our homes. I prefer outside this building for those who are not comfortable coming to a church, but we'll do whatever we have to do, right? But I'm thinking the timing on this, I, we've been having a hard time. 93 to 94. So, yeah, around 30 years ago. God put it on Pastor Kuhn's heart, our former lead pastor here, also my father, to reach Kent County by being in our homes, doing Bible studies and groups and connection with the lost and with each other as the body of Christ. Because we need more than an hour and 15, 20 minutes on a Sunday. And God gave him Acts 20, 20. And what year is it? <laughs> And for the past three years, God has been rebirthing this vision in me, and I believe God is resurrecting this vision for our church. And many of us will go, I, I can't do that. I, I can't, I, I'm not a leader. God has gifted you to make brownies. Some of you make the greatest brownies in the world. God has gifted you with opening your home or just being friendly to others around you. Or he has a friend that would be willing to do it and you help lead and, and lead Bible study or just read scripture together and pray. And I'm going to talk more about this on Wednesday night. But listen, the enemy doesn't want us to be together because if we are, there's power in when we love one another. And when the lost see our love for each other, they go, Ooh, who, what is this about? That's scripture. So, on Wednesday night, I will be, once again, urging and pushing us towards being together in community again. And then on uh, this month coming up, September, we will be full swing in groups. Of course, we can use safety precautions. If some groups aren't ready to meet in person, thank God for Zoom and online groups. But I got to tell you, it's not the same. When I got to pray for a brother today and put my hand on his shoulder with our mask on, that meant a lot to me. And I'm praying for the day where we, and things are looking better in Delaware, right? Things are looking good. But I want to think about those who are scared. I want to think about those who do have risks. So we thank God that we have a digital team, that we have a tech online team. So that brings me to my next point of our vision. In March, our church had to drastically switch to online church. And if it wasn't for our tech director, Jared Lopez, we would not have had church for the past five months online. <laughs> Praise God. And we're grateful for you that you have given to our church to, for us to invest in a person with his skills and, and skill set. But here's the reality. We're only, doing, we're only broadcasting mainly Sunday morning and prayer time and sometimes, you know, we have uh, struggles with that. We need more help in our tech department. We need a digital media director that's going to help us create content to help us film more, like uh, record podcasts, video logs, do more online time together with you. Jody has a vision for more conferences online, but we just don't have the manpower because that team back there who's been phenomenal they're so concentrated on Sunday that it's hard to do anything throughout the week. Imagine us trimming down our sermons to 10 minutes, and then you watch that with your group in your house and talk about the sermon using our after-the-sermon outlines. We don't have enough manpower to make that happen. Now, here's the reality, though. Guess what that takes? Finances. And to, to hire someone and equip them with equipment could be 30 to 50 grand for it just one year. So financially, we're going to need the help to make that happen. And to be honest with you, we're behind the line. We're behind the ball there, and we need to catch up. 
Because we see that the world is online watching and we want to catch every single person we can in that net and bring them into the kingdom of God. Amen? And I just want to say thank you once again to our tech team, our digital media, social media team, Lindsay, all your volunteers. Lindsay is not hired to do that and she's been doing such an awesome job. Sam, Sam Cruz, is he in this room? Somewhere. Sam, yeah, he's going to be doing the post show. Post, uh, yeah, there you go, buddy. Hey, Sam was not supposed to be a worship leader. (laughs) God had different plans, right? And he's done such a phenomenal job. He has. And the worship team has been doing great. And, uh, but we know that we need a full-time person in that position. And um, we found someone. Praise God. And after a year search of praying... And just seeking God's will on that and uh, driving our worship team nuts. Uh, They've been so awesome. By the way, at one point, Jared was doing tech and then drumming at the same time. So hats off to him. But uh, Sam belongs in the outreach department and and preaching and teaching and making disciples alongside me. And he hasn't been able to do that for the past year, helping out with worship. And uh, we're, we're happy to announce that starting next week, Aria Walker from Valley Forge, University of Valley Forge, will be our next worship director. So what's interesting is, is all three of those developments or those, the vision I'm talking about today at the end of this message fit all three things I see in Scripture that matter the most. Love and worship God, a worship director. We need to worship God more than ever during the time we're living in. Expect worship during our prayer nights now because we'll have someone to be able to play and sing with us during our prayer online. Um, We want to reach more people and make disciples online more than we ever have and in person where we need a digital media director to help us do that, to create content, the gospel, online and in person. I can't wait for that. And then we need to be together to love one another to encourage one another. I mean, has this been overwhelming and draining or what? It is not good for man to be alone, the Bible says. For mankind, we're meant to be together. And if that means we have to wear masks and be together six feet, okay. I'm praying for the day where that doesn't have to be that case either. But all I know is all three of the things that matter in Scripture, the commands of God, God is leading us to fill those roles in those places. And to go in the direction we're going. And in the midst of the chaos, we will not quit as a church. We never stopped in March, and we will not stop now. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Would you stand together with me? We don't know what awaits us, but we know God is good. His message is good, and his mission is good. I just, I have a peace because I know whatever comes next, God is already there. And I, have a, I asked permission in the first church, can I have permission to be transparent with you one more time? Because you need to know my heart as a pastor so you can trust me and understand where I come from. And I grew up in a pastor's home, so I've seen this when I'm getting ready to tell you. I watched my dad, I heard my dad cry out for, for these three things to God. Pastors carry... I I wrapped it up into three things. We carry a lot, and so do you. You know what I'm talking about when I say these. There's three burdens that we carry with us all the time. Number one is the spiritual health and physical health of our church body, Our, our, our people here. We care so much about how you're doing spiritually, if you're growing, if you're okay, physically, your health. That's why we have people in those places to help serve us. The second thing is our heart breaks for the lost because we know where they'll go without Jesus. Pastors, we stay up at night and leaders, we, we, we lose sleep at night over the well-being of our church and then the lost. And the last one that a lot of pastors don't want to talk about because of fear, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we lose sleep over the finances of our church because we know the responsibility of keeping staff and keeping the mission going. And we know what we could do if the money overflowed. We know what we can do here. This church is active in using the money to reach this world. 
This past week was just another example of how together we can do this. And I just wanna challenge us as a church, even if you're brand new here, this goes for you because if you're studying scripture, you're gonna read this whether you're alone or whether you're with the church, that we need to be all in to obey God's commands and obey his word. And church, you can trust me, trust God more than anyone, right? As the word says, but you can trust that I am going to be all in. My family is all in no matter what comes our way. We're all in to love God, to love and encourage one another, and to reach the unreached. And that means my time, my talents, and my treasure. So I just wanna encourage you, church. You heard my heart today. You see where we're going. And no matter what happens, we're sticking to it. We're not quitting. God is good, amen? You know what I'm talking about because you love your family. You would do anything for them. You know your purpose. Maybe you don't, but if you know your purpose, you know you just keep going. You, you have vision and goals in your life and you keep going. It's the same thing here. And by the way, you're our family and we're in this together. So I will see you. If you're able to come out Wednesday night, I will see you. I'm gonna share why we need groups and what they look like. And uh, I'm excited for that. And I just wanna say thank you for your faithfulness. And this past week, you showed up big. Maybe you don't realize it, but people showed up big and we're just thankful. So let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that while we don't know what is next, you do. And when you need us to know, you will give us a heads up. In the meantime, God, your word says to love one another. Your word says to worship and love you. And your word says to reach the unreached with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no matter what's taking place in our world, God, we should not get away from those priorities in our lives. And so Calvary recommits ourselves to be all in in your mission. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, have an amazing Sunday.